30 years ago, in 1993, the movie Gettysburg hit the big screen. Charge. Charge! And has been inspiring war gamers ever since. But how historically accurate is the film? If you look at all the fake beards, you have to question its authenticity. I mean, come on, Stuart's beard? Give me a break. So, my fellow wargamers and I are going to ask an expert. Hi, my name's Eric Lindblad. I am an author, historian, licensed battlefield guide here at Gettysburg National Military Park, and co-host of the highly popular Battle of Gettysburg podcast with my fellow colleague, Jim Hessler. Let's see if one of our favorite films about the Civil War is good, bad, or ugly. Let's get started. Hey, like many war gamers, I am a fan of John Buford and his cavalry action on the first day of the battle. Whenever we play a game, we want to get that cavalry out there, skirmish, fight, hold back the Confederates as long as we can. And in the movie, it really shows the Union fighting tooth and nail uh, on day one. That flank. Hold it. My question is, is the depiction of Buford's cavalry on day one accurate? Did they really fight as hard as the film shows? So the question was, how accurate is the depiction of John Buford's division's stand here on McPherson's Ridge on the morning of July 1st? How accurate is it in terms of the movie Gettysburg? Well, as I always say about the movie Gettysburg, there's some good, there's some bad, there's also some ugly. This is one of the more iconic scenes. Obviously, John Buford and his division arrives in Gettysburg on June 30th. They've scouted out parts of Robert E. Lee's army. Their orders are to lay the advance of that army to allow John Reynolds and part of the Union infantry to get onto the battlefield, maybe get a better handle of this situation. And one of the more iconic scenes of the movie is depicted on the ridge that we are on right now. This is McPherson's Ridge. In fact, where this fence is, is essentially what's recreated in the movie. You'll see behind me as well, the Edward McPherson uh, barn. That is all that remains of the farm. But in 1863, you would have had an, a house, number of outbuildings here as well. So the situation that John Buford's men would have been facing on the morning of July 1st is moving from the west towards us are two brigades of Henry Heath's 7,000 man division. So the idea is that when the movie it shows almost this knockdown, drag out, last ditch effort, almost Alamo on McPherson's Ridge. The reality is, is that Buford actually did not suffer a lot of casualties here. In fact, his division suffers less than 10% casualties on July 1st. And of course, by July 2nd, they're off the battlefield altogether, moving back to Westminster, Maryland. So the depiction of just this rail, line, this rail fence line being lined with blue troopers is not that accurately depicted. Of course, the movie, I think, is trying to give a sense of the drama and really the importance of holding it. It's not as dramatic if you say, well, I've deployed skirmishers out about two and a half miles in front. We've got our vedettes out here to the west and to the north. That's not as exciting as having a knockdown drag out fight. So in terms of how it's depicted, the delay aspect of Buford, I think is accurately depicted. The actual fighting scene, pretty badly depicted in my opinion. Um, there are probably a lot more dead troopers on the film of the movie Gettysburg than there ever were on this ridge on July 1st in reality. But of course, don't let the facts get in the way of a good story. All right, so my question would be, how accurate did the movie depict General Lee's command and control and interaction and contribution on the first day of Gettysburg? We'll get out of control, Mr. Heath. That is why we have orders. Is it possible you could have misunderstood them? No, sir. Can you identify those people? The infantry is the first car, the Black Hats. There's another car coming up we still haven't identified. I must have all possible information on the enemy's threat. Major Taylor. Sir. I want you to ride forward yourself to the highest position and observe, and do be careful. Yes, sir. Help! Sir, shall I attack? No, sir. We are not yet ready. What to was care. Robert E. Lee's command style like on the morning and afternoon of July 1st, 1863? Now, for the most part, Lee is not what we would call a micromanager today. Lee's idea of being a general is I'm going to tell you what I want done, and he's going to leave it up to you to figure out the best way to accomplish it. Now, for some individuals, like a Stonewall Jackson, a James Longstreet, or even a Jeb Stewart, 
that's a really good command dynamic that lets them have kind of that freedom and creativity to best deploy their troops into battle. But the situation that we're going to see on July 1st is a little bit different. Robert E. Lee that day was not anticipating a battle. In fact, he will still be at his headquarters in Cashtown, Pennsylvania, about eight and a half miles to our southwest from where I'm standing right now, when he's going to begin to hear that very unmistakable sound of battle. Now, just two days before, on June 29th, Robert E. Lee had issued orders to his army to not bring on a general engagement or battle unless they can do so to an advantage. Well, now what Robert E. Lee is going to see by the morning of July 1st is that his army has been drawn into a fight he was not expecting. So in many ways, Lee, I don't want to say he's not in direct command on the battlefield, but a lot of the heavy lifting is done by his corps commanders, his division commanders, and his brigade commanders that day. Lee is more or less walking into a good situation and in my opinion, signing off on that situation and letting his army do the rest. All right, Eric, my question was about the, the scene in the movie where General Isaac Trimble visits Lee's headquarters on the evening of uh, day one and is very upset about General Ewell's failure to take Culp's Hill during that day. And he famously says, Sir, give me one division and I will take that hill. And he said nothing. He just stood there. He stared at me. I said, General Ewell, give me one brigade and I will take that hill. I was becoming disturbed. And General Ewell put his arms behind him and blinked. So I said, General, give me one regiment and I will take that hill. Did that conversation really happen that way? But in my opinion, it's Hollywood. Isaac Trimble is one of those individuals that is very talented, but when he comes and rejoins Lee's army in the summer of 1863, he's a major general without a command. And Trimble himself will, of course, be one of those after the war that had only they listened to Trimble, things might have been different. Trimble's one of those individuals that always seems to have the right answer at the right time course, I always say we're much better generals after the fact. The reality is, the situation on the afternoon of July 1st is this. After the Union 11th and 1st Corps begin to break back towards Cemetery Hill, Richard Ewell's troops are in pursuit. But at this moment, Robert E. Lee will issue very, some will say, very vague orders to Richard Ewell. General Ewell, take that hill if practicable, but do not bring on a general engagement. Well, what exactly does that mean? For someone like Richard Yule, he really sort of stresses out over these orders. He doesn't know which path to take. And in my opinion, I think ultimately Richard Yule makes the right decision. I think the movie does a great disservice to General Richard Yule, and I think maybe gives too much credence to what Major General Isaac Trimble had to say in that famous scene. It's been decades since I've seen this movie, so my question is about the one scene that has stayed with me all that time since I last saw it. Left wing, right wheel. Right wheel! Charge. Charge! How accurate was the depiction of the fighting on Little Round Top? Well, keep in mind that fighting primarily focuses on really three regiments that were on that hill, the 20th Maine, the 15th Alabama, and the 47th Alabama, under the command of Colonel William Oates. Now, for the most part, I think the, the depiction was fairly accurate. It is challenging for the Confederates making those repeated attacks. Are the 20th Maine running out of ammunition that day? Certainly. Are they exhausted? You can almost guarantee they are. The big question is the famous scene of where of course, Joshua Chamberlain at the top of his lungs calls out bayonets. That is one account of what happens. We know there was an attack made that afternoon. It involved bayonets and it involved a charge. Now, how they got to that point, that depends on the sources you read. Of course, if you would have asked Joshua Chamberlain after the war, certainly I gave the order to launch the bayonet charge. But there's also some evidence from men in the 20th Maine that that attack happened almost organically. They just kind of did it. Uh, one soldier said we actually pushed ahead to actually try to uh, retake some of our wounded that were down below and protect them. So however it occurred, there was a charge made. Does it play a critical role in holding the left end of Little Round Top? Absolutely. 
But what is forgotten in the movie are all the individuals that are fighting on the side of the hill we're looking at right now. Regiments like the 44th New York, the 16th Michigan, and an unsung hero of Little Round Top, the 140th New York under the command of Colonel Patrick O'Rourke. All of these units will play a role in holding that hill on July 2nd. In many ways, this, the Union defense of Little Round Top is very much a team effort. Uh, Chamberlain plays a critical role in his aspect, but we cannot also forget the contributions of officers such as Colonel Strong Vincent, as well as Colonel Patrick O'Rourke as well. Colonel, we watch from our position above. It's the damnedest thing I ever saw. May I? May I shake your hand, sir? Uh, Colonel, one thing. The uh, uh, name of this place is Hill. Has it got a name, this Hill? This is Little Round Top. There are so many great characters and performances uh, in the movie Gettysburg. Love that movie. But Eric, what I would really like to know is from your perspective as a historian, which character on either side do you think got the most accurate historical portrayal? And maybe more interestingly, which historical personality do you think was treated unfairly and got the least accurate portrayal in the movie? In my opinion, the character that I feel is the best portrayed is probably Jeff Daniels as Colonel Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. I think from everything I've read about Chamberlain, he seems to have kind of nailed that role very well. You always got the sense of this is just kind of an everyday guy put in very extraordinary moments. And I think that is certainly the case with Chamberlain. I think Daniels does an excellent job of a very nuanced performance of it. As far as who I think is the worst portrayed, and this may get some, some angry letters, but I think it's actually John Buford as portrayed by Sam Elliott. Now, Sam Elliott's a great actor, but Sam Elliott has made a career really portraying Sam Elliott, not John Buford. In many ways, Buford was a much more warm, engaging officer than what you really see here in the movie. In many ways, he's kind of portrayed as almost this aloof loner here. Uh, almost this kind of outcast among everybody else. When Buford dies a few months after this battle, he'll actually die in the arms of one of his staff officers. This shows a very warm, strong relationship that Buford would have had with these men. And really, uh, Buford was very invested in the officers underneath him. While Sam Elliott puts in a great performance as Sam Elliott, I don't think it's an accurate depiction of what John Buford would have been like personality-wise, or maybe even command-wise here on the battlefield at Gettysburg. Hey, Eric, uh, I was wondering about the character of the British Colonel Fremantle who shows up and hangs out with the Confederates in the movie. Uh, how accurate was that? Were, were there really foreign observers with the Confederacy? I believe I've had the pleasure. How was the depiction of Arthur Fremantle, the British military officer of the famed Coldstream Guards who comes over and watches this great American Civil War? And of course, Fremantle is in many ways one of the more, I think, inaccurately depicted characters in the movie. Uh, he is a professional soldier of the British Army. He comes from a military family. In fact, he was named after his father's former boss, the Duke of Wellington, uh, who Arthur Fremantle's father served under as an aide de camp at the Battle of Waterloo. But Fremantle himself called himself a war tourist. He's going to actually cross into the United States along the Mexico-Texas border around Matamoros and goes up into Brownsville, Texas, and then makes this very roundabout trek throughout the Confederacy. It is one of the more, I think, important diaries or memoirs of the American Civil War because what Fremantle is doing is meeting almost every major Confederate figure in the summer of 1863 before he eventually makes his way here to Gettysburg. Now, in Fremantle's account, he talks about times climbing up a tree to get a better view of the battlefield that would be to my front, south and east of Gettysburg. Unfortunately, that tree is not standing today. My personal belief, and from what I've kind of looked at from some of the sources and other things, I believe that tree is more or less where the chapel of the Lutheran Theological Seminary is today, right next door to the famed classroom and dormitory building with, of course, the famed cupola that is prominently depicted in the movie. In many ways, uh, Fremantle kind of almost is the closest you're going to get to comedic relief in the movie Gettysburg. Uh, of course, wearing the red uniform. Of course, he was not wearing a red uniform here. We actually have a photo of what he looked like. He was actually wearing a brown or tan hunting coat. Uh, he would have looked more like a backwoodsman from Texas than probably he would have looked like a British officer here. Uh, but of course, a very iconic 
uh, portrayal and one of the more famous foreign observers to ever witness our American Civil War. In the movie, uh, we see Stephen Lang galloping back and forth during Pickett's charge. And he's making a big show of things and saying, where are my boys? I can't see my boys. How accurate is that? It seems a little overly dramatic and visual, not like what I think of as terms of command and control. We are now standing on the Nicholas Cadori farm in 1863, and across the Emmitsburg Road from us is an orchard. And in the movie Gettysburg, there is a depiction of George Pickett late in the attack on July 3rd, seeming very, seeming very much confused about the situation. And the question that many visitors have, and I believe the question uh, that the viewer has, is where exactly was Pickett? What was he doing during this? Well, we know that Pickett was fairly active. We do have accounts of Pickett off to our south in the Peach Orchard, which would have given him a great view of Cemetery Ridge. We also believe that as his final attack was cresting onto the ridge, that George Pickett was likely across the road from us in the orchard, using the buildings of the Kadori Farm to certainly shield him. As a division commander, there is nothing wrong with that, that he is exactly where he needs to be in the line. But he does move around quite a bit which I think having picket appearances in, nor in different parts of the field has certainly confused some scholars of the battle because if he's in the peach orchard and then he's in the orchard across the Kadori farm, well, where exactly was he? Well, he was in a lot of places on July 3rd. So full disclosure, I am not the biggest George Pickett fan in the world, but on July 3rd, I think he is for the most part where he needed to be as a division commander. When I watched Pickett Charge, I thought it was super dumb how the, the Confederates, you know, how they climbed over the fence during Pickett's Church. They couldn't just go through the part that was broken. It's, that would save them a lot of time. They had to climb over for some reason. They didn't just go through the holes. Is that the way it really happened? Behind me is one of the most famous locations in the Gettysburg National Military Park. It is, of course, the famous Cops of Trees on Cemetery Ridge, the legendary aiming point for three divisions of Confederates on the afternoon of July 3rd as they are attempting to break the Union line on Cemetery Ridge, what history is going to come to remember as Pickett's Charge. It is really one of the longer scenes in the movie Gettysburg. It is one of the more iconic scenes in the movie Gettysburg, and for the most part, I think they get it fairly right. Uh, many of the descriptions of Confederates leaving Seminary Ridge on July 3rd talked about the perfect lines of battle they had. One Confederate even said, we moved out in magnificent style. Another talked about our perfect lines of battle moving out. So I believe that is fairly accurately depicted. Now, the one area where I'm gonna give quibbles to is that really it gives you a very picket-centric view of this attack. One division, 6,000 men. Well, we know there was two other divisions, also two other brigades. You have the divisions of Johnston Pettigrew, the divisions of Isaac Trimble. Trimble will get mentioned in it. Pettigrew has the brief scene where he tries to give Longstreet his book, which I think is total bunk, but oh well, I don't make movies, I'm just a historian. So what we will see is that it really gives you more of a picket-centric view. It also doesn't show the brigades of Cadmus Wilcox or David Lang that come up to support the attack either. The one area where I think we will see a quibble on is that it's maybe a much more sanitized version of what it would have looked like. The accounts of Confederate soldiers coming across the Emmitsburg Road on July 3rd, some of them are absolutely spine chilling when you read some of what they say. Uh, rounds of canister smashing in, one Union soldier remembered, knapsacks and guns tossed in the air, bodies being hurled into the air. They don't really depict that in the movie. Now keep in mind, this was made for television originally and then makes it to the movies. So obviously we cannot have essentially the opening scene of Saving Private Ryan in the Emmitsburg Road and put it on TNT in the mid-1990s. You just can't do that. But what we will see is that for the most part, the, act, the action is fairly accurate. Uh, even though it maybe gives you a more narrow view, but I think in terms of a battle scene in the movie Gettysburg, Pickett's Charge is probably the one that holds up the best of any that is depicted in the movie. So in the Gettysburg film, there's a lot made about the relationship between Armistead and Hancock. It's sort of a subplot uh, that they're very emotionally attached, and then at the end of the battle, they're asking each other, uh, asking after each other to make sure that they both survived. Is that, is that accurate to reality? Were there actually, um, was there a relationship between Armistead and Hancock before the war? And, and was what happened to them in the battle uh, what was portrayed in the film? 
Now, one of the more, I think, touching aspects of the movie Gettysburg is the relationship depicted between Confederate General Louis Armistead and Union General Winfield Scott Hancock. Now, the movie makes it out to seem that these were really best friends, almost brothers, if you will. Was there a friendship? Yes. Keep in mind, the United States Army, when the war breaks out, numbers around 16,000 soldiers. Many of those soldiers are along the eastern seaboard or out west in these kind of isolated posts. So your options for socializing were very limited. So in many cases, these officers became very close, not because necessarily they were very good friends, but who else are you going to hang out with? There's only so many officers and families at a post. So did Hancock and Armistead have a friendship? Yes, I certainly believe so. Was it as strong as what's depicted in the movie? Eh, the record's a little more murkier on that, but I think it certainly speaks to those bonds that were certainly ripped when the nation goes to war in 1861. The movie depicts several scenes where Longstreet and Lee kind of butt heads on tactics. And it really shows Longstreet as kind of having the right decisions where Lee is kind of off in the clouds somewhere. Is that an accurate depiction of their relationship at Gettysburg? The movie at times depicts a good bit of pushback by Longstreet against Robert E. Lee. And I believe to a certain extent that is very true. Now keep in mind when Robert E. Lee's army invades Pennsylvania in the summer of 1863, Longstreet will be Lee's second in command. One of the more oft told inaccuracies of the wars when people would often refer to Stonewall Jackson as Lee's second in command. Even when Jackson was in the picture, Longstreet was still the senior officer. So is Longstreet pushing back against Lee? I certainly think he is. And in Longstreet's memoirs, he is going to note that before the Confederate Army even came into Pennsylvania, that Robert E. Lee is going to agree to a campaign that was offensively minded strategically, but when it came time to fight a battle, it was going to be fought defensively. Personally, I have a hard time believing Robert E. Lee would have committed to a battle plan before his army has even stepped foot north of the Potomac River. Are Longstreet and Lee having a certain level of disagreement? I believe so. Would it be any different than what you would see in many high commands? Probably not. I think in some ways the movie maybe plays it up a little bit more than what it be. I think especially July 1st and July 2nd. July 3rd, I think for the most part they probably get it fairly right. Now there's one more famous scene here at the club that we have always thought about. If I attack as ordered, I'll lose half my division. And they'll still be looking down the throats at us from that rocky hill right there. We must move around to the right, sir, and take them from the rear. Sam. And we decided to use a war game to answer that. Please check out our other video, Should Hood Have Moved Around to the Right? Now here's Eric's final thoughts on Wargaming and the movie Gettysburg. So in closing, what are some lessons that Wargamers can take from the movie Gettysburg? How can they use it? First and foremost, I would say it's best used as background noise while you're playing on your table. I would not use it as historic gospel. In many ways, what is portrayed on the screen is a far cry from what actually happened here on the days of July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, 1863. But it is an incredibly fun movie. It is one, a movie that has brought millions of people to the battlefield, and hopefully it will inspire you to come to the battlefield. See it for yourself. I always say part of my job as a battlefield guide is to take what for many people is a two-dimensional experience. You're reading it in a book, you're seeing it on the movie screen, you see a map, and really giving you the three-dimensional view of it. You cannot fully understand this battlefield until you've actually stood on it. So one of the things I will say is, if you want to have something great in the background as you're playing, certainly the movie Gettysburg, you can't beat it. But I would certainly not use it as a guide to how you want to develop scenarios or really anything in historical keeping with the battle itself.